Hello and welcome to Westeros.org's YouTube channel. This is the video review for episode 4, The Spoils of War. In terms of spoilers for book readers, uh, this one is uh, a relatively safe episode, I would say. Um, there's a major battle towards the end, but uh, it is very dependent on show-specific storylines, I would say. So I don't think there will be anything quite like it in the books. And the other scenes are fairly minor. I mean, there's... Uh, there's development along all the storylines, but it's this episode is clearly very much about the ending, which um, goes on for quite a while. In Winterfell, we have another reunion this week, as Arya finally reaches her home and reunites with Bran and Sansa. Uh, before that happens, however, we have a scene with Bran and Littlefinger, which... Um, well, Littlefinger is being his usual strange, mystifying self. Um, it makes sense that he would try and cozy up to Bran as he does. Uh, he's um, saying that he, you know, he wants to protect him, sort of in his mother's name. Uh, he uh, calls him Lord Stark. But then the weird bit is when he gives him the Valyrian steel dagger that was used in the assassination attempt on Bran in season one. Why is this being brought back now? Um, What's Littlefinger's reason for giving him the dagger? Um, he can't tell him anything about it, apparently, because when Bran asks who uh, uh, who it belonged to, <clears throat> he says he doesn't know. Um, but says that this is the question that started the War of the Five Kings. So he's not able to offer Bran any more information about uh, who tried to kill him and... Uh, played an important part in the downfall of his family, essentially. So why um, why he thinks it's good to give it to Bran, who then later on gives it away to Arya, because he sees no point in him, a cripple, having it. Um, so it's very weird. It could just be one of these many callbacks to earlier episodes and earlier seasons uh, that they're filling this season with. Uh, there's another one in the Bran and Littlefinger scene. Uh, Littlefinger uh, mentions chaos, and uh, Bran sort of stares strangely at him and says, Chaos is a ladder, which gets him a funny look from Littlefinger, of course. Um, this is supposed to be obviously Bran having seen, heard, you know, he knows everything, has seen everything, and Littlefinger doesn't know what to make of it. So they are doing a lot of these callbacks, too many for my taste, even if I like sort of going back to the beginning when you're nearing the end. Um, but a lot of it feels a bit like fan service and I don't know that it'll go anywhere. So it, it may be the same with the dagger. Um, in the books, it had an actual point. There was a mystery that could be figured out. Uh, the fact that Littlefinger claimed that um, it belonged to Tyrion, that he lost it gambling to Tyrion when Tyrion bet against Jaime. Uh, we learn that Tyrion never bets against Jaime, and in fact, Littlefinger lost it to Robert. So Littlefinger did one of these lies with a grain of truth in it, and that is the basis for being able to figure out the fact that uh, Joffrey was behind the assassination attempt. Um, I don't see the point of revealing Joffrey as the uh, instigator of the assassination attempt at this point, um, which makes me really wonder about the point of of, of this whole exercise. Uh, but it wouldn't be the first time they go down the little blind alleys like this. Um, other than that, Bran has a really good scene, and um, that was not an earthquake, that was Breeze shaking and the table, <clears throat> but um, he's now lying down and will hopefully stay still. Uh, but uh, anyway, Bran has a really nice scene with Mira, I think. And again, it's showing Bran as very distant, um, sort of removed from his humanity. And then the idea that, as uh, Mira finally says, you died in that cave. Um, I really like this interpretation of Bran. Like I said last time, I don't think he's supposed to be out of the cave. But uh, this gives uh, a nice approximation of... Uh, uh, how distant and how removed he might be from his family in the end. 
As far as Arya goes, well, her reunion scene with Sansa is cute. Um, but I don't quite buy this mostly normal Arya. Uh, I find I find it difficult to see this character after what she's supposed to have been through. Uh, and then we get uh, the real cringe moment of uh, the Winterfell storyline, which is when Arya decides that she's going to train with Brienne. Um, the choreography of that fight scene is um, a little bit painful to watch. Um, they obviously thought it should be a bit of Arya being badass and she finally finishes by basically she's had needle knocked out of her hand and then she pulls out the dagger that she's gotten from Bran and uh, uses that to sort of make a move and put it against Brienne's throat and I don't know. Uh, it wasn't very impressive and it... Uh, Certainly wasn't any, any of the high points of this episode. On Dragonstone, we start off with a bit of girl talk. Apparently, Missandei and Grey Worm got up to many things before he left for Casterly Rock, and Danny wants to hear about them. However, instead she gets an invitation to visit a cave by John. Maybe he learned a thing or two from Ygrit, who invited him into a cave. Um, or two. But uh, no, John actually wants to show Danny some uh, paintings in the cave. Um, so it's art studies, nothing else that's on his mind, even though it does seem to get a little cozy and intimate down there. Uh, and then Davos is making some jokes about him eyeing her good heart. Um, the paintings are of the uh, children and the first men fighting the White Walkers together. And I am guessing this may be a little bit inspired by uh, a cave that is mentioned in uh, one of the unreleased chapters from The Winds of Winter. Uh, I don't think it's specifically said to feature children and first men together, but it's uh, markings and paintings that show that the children were there in the past. So it's possible that they were on Dragonstone as well. Um, not at all, uh, would not all rule that, rule that out, and maybe the connection to the obsidian that's supposed to be there, that, that could very well work. After they get out of the cave, they get the news that they did indeed take Castle Rock, but of course uh, it was all, you know, a sham, they didn't really have the army there, and uh, so it's all bad news, and Danny gets pretty pissy with Tyrion and starts accusing him of maybe protecting his family instead of actually wanting to defeat them. So now she wants to take her three large dragons and fly off to the Red Keep. That actually sounds like a really good idea. Um, everyone has been talking about how she shouldn't be burning cities, but burning the Red Keep? Yeah, why not? Why? What's the problem with her doing, you know, an Aegon against Harrenhal and telling people, hey, you've got this much time, uh, get out of there and, you know, by sunset, uh, I'm going to toast this place. But no, they have to talk her out of that. John tells her that, you know, by burning cast melting castles and burning cities, she'll be just like everyone else. Um, yeah, I guess he's buying into the whole break the wheel thing, but then again, she's talking about her, you know, Iron Throne and her right to the Iron Throne all the time. So what does she want? I mean, how, how, how's it going to be? Are we breaking the wheel or do you want the Iron Throne? Uh, and if you want the Iron Throne, well, then your ancestor, Aegon the Conqueror, has some, you know, good tips for you how to take the Iron Throne. And maybe, maybe, you should follow some of them. Speaking of King's Landing and the Red Keep, uh, Cersei is having another meeting with Tycho from the Iron Bank and they are now talking about how she is going to be repaying the whole debt in one stroke with the gold taken from Highgarden. So apparently the Tyrells were sitting on enough gold in Highgarden to pay off all of the Crown's debt to the Iron Bank in one go. Yeah, more creative economy on uh, Game of Thrones. That is about as likely as the Lannisters being totally broke. And then she's going to take a new loan out with uh, the Iron Bank and she's going to use it to get the Golden Company. Um, is this just a nod to the fact that they're figuring in the book plot or are they actually going to be uh, part of the, uh, you know, the, the, 
one of the players in uh, the next season or later in this season. I mean, they could show up in this season as well. It's uh, nothing prevents them from sipping over from Essos in a week or two. Um, but uh, certainly if you look at the end of this episode, it seems like Cersei could use some, you know, more men for her army, perhaps. It doesn't really seem to exist after this episode. Um, but yeah, and Tycho thinks this is a good idea because apparently the Golden Company makes excellent debt collectors. I'm sure they might have assisted the Iron Bank uh, in the past. Um, you know, they'll anyone who can pay their contract, they will do um, what they're paid to do. But it does make it sound like they're sort of regular debt collectors collectors for the Iron Bank, and I don't really think that is the case. And that's certainly not why they are called the Golden Company, at least. The episode finale takes place outside of King's Landing. The uh, caravan of the Lannister um, soldiers with the, all the loot from the Reach, the gold and the gra grain and all of that, uh, has gotten there and they've gotten the gold into the city as noted, but they um, They're I guess getting some water by the river and gathering up stragglers and so on and um, While Jamie is chatting with Braun and Dick and Tarly, there is um, a bit of a sound and Then a horde of Dothraki appear above a hill and they stare at that and and something breaks through the clouds and swoops down towards them, and that's Drogon. Uh, the first shot, the, the, the very first view of Drogon breaking through the clouds, that's really impressive. Without a doubt, you know, they've used the budget really well here. This is quite a grand spectacle. Uh, the fact that they can pull off using the dragons in this way um, was something that you probably didn't think for a long while was actually going to be possible. So, um, can't complain about that. It it really, you know, it gives you the chills seeing Drogon coming down like that. Uh, reminded me of um, Aegon's attack on Heron Hall when he you know, takes the dragon really high up and then dives down through the clouds towards the castle. So, very cool visual and everything. Unfortunately, even when they do these grand spectacles, which is probably, you know, their one remaining strength as far as I see it, because a lot of other things have gone by the wayside just to provide for these spectacular moments, they are still doing shortcuts in terms of uh, plot holes and character decisions. They want certain things to happen and then they force it to happen that way. In this case, why is the Lannister army logging around Kyburn Scorpion? Uh, it seems like it would be a pretty poor defense for an army on the move. Wouldn't it be better to have it at King's Landing, which really seems like it's pretty stripped of defenses at this point. So having one more stationary defense there um, seems like a good idea, unless the idea is that let's try and lure Danny and the dragons out with this convoy. Uh, in that case, they weren't particularly prepared for it. And then uh, Danny's decisions are also really peculiar. Um, again, they obviously talked her out and of attacking the Red Keep and had her instead attack the army. Uh, certainly, she managed to kill a lot of soldiers by doing it. But we all we still have the issue of how on earth is she staying on that dragon? Um, why isn't Tyrion being useful and designing at least a harness for her and, you know, a saddle and a harness if they don't want to go with armor for her, which is weird because even Cersei got armor when she wasn't supposed to be in fighting. So a more martial Danny would make sense. And, I mean, Bran has a wheelchair now and Tyrion designed a special saddle for him, you know, way back in season two. So, or was it even season one? I... I I'm forgetting at this point, but um, Danny gets nothing. She gets to click on to Drogon, and it looks pretty precarious at some point, so I'm really not supposed how that's supposed to be physically possible for her, because he seems to be flying at some pretty good speeds. And then, once uh, Braun manages to fire the scorpion at Drogon once, and she sees that big bolt go past, 
What does she do? Does she withdraw and let the Dothraki on the ground deal with the remaining soldiers? There's not a lot of them. Um, they could easily have destroyed the scorpion themselves. No, she puts herself in range of it. Um, not really sound tactics. Uh, maybe it's supposed to be just temperament. Uh, but if she's been listening to her advisors, maybe, you know, she could just keep that in mind or something. So it just requires more stupidity to make these decisions. Um, and it's something that uh, a lot of the uh, structuring seems to depend on this season, which I'll get back to um, in the sort of little wrap up, and that there are some real problems with how they want to portray the fighting. Uh, I won't take issue, however, with the, the uh, attempt from Jamie to uh, to kill Danny and uh, end the war in one stroke. I mean, when things went poorly for him against Rob, that's what he tried to do at the Whispering Wood. He tried to cut through and get to Rob and figured that will decide it. So, you know, it's a very knightly thing to do, to charge against uh, a dragon. And that's, you know, essentially what he's doing. He's disregarding uh, the danger of uh, that very huge irritated dragon to try and end the war. Um, obviously that doesn't work and um, I'm going to guess we haven't seen the last Jamie, even though it should be very difficult to get out of uh, the water in armor and everything, but um, that's probably not the end. Um, so yeah, it's, it's disappointing that they can't put these um, even the spectacle together, without having to um, rely on really weird character decisions. A lot of this episode was basically waiting for the battle to happen, and as such it was uh, relatively inoffensive. I came up with fairly few eye rolls, I think. Uh, Littlefinger definitely deserved one. Uh, so did Arya sparring the uh, the massive amounts of Tyrell gold, and then uh, a lengthy one for um, bad battle tactics and stupid decisions that are used to get a scene to work out. I really have very little tolerance for that. Uh, but other than that, you know, there were some good points. I said that first shot of Drogon, loved it. Uh, I also thought that Bran's scene with Mira was really nice. Um, Arya's sparring with Brienne was not, and nor was at the, um, uh, the, the latter half of the battle with all the things that uh, had to, had to happen for things to go, to get the scene that they wanted with, you know, with, uh, Jaime being able to charge Danny when she's dismounted from the wounded Drogon, which also seemed like a bit of a weird decision. He didn't seem that badly off and perfectly able to toast a few remaining Lannister soldiers. But, um, as I said, I was going to get back to this, and it is the fact that they have had Danny's side make a lot of weird decisions or uh, have things go against them for um, um, no good reason, like basically urine having information that there's no explanation for how he's getting information about where her fleet is and how he's able to get past Dragonstone um, and go off to uh, Casterly Rock and get the, Unsullied, the fleet with the Unsullied without anybody noticing anything. And Varys seems to be completely useless. Uh, he, you know, he had contacts outside of King's Landing, even if Kyburn's supposed to have his little birds there. Uh, he doesn't do any good for her. And um, they're basically making up for the lack of uh, more sides in the conflict. They're constantly stripping down uh, what Danny is able to do. And uh, right now, I'm going to guess that they're going to have, I mean, whether they are going to rely on her not wanting to use to Dothraki any more than she did here in the battle, that she's going to stick to not using them against towns or cities. And I guess that the Unsullied are going to take longer than anyone else on this show to cross Westeros so that she can't just besiege King's Landing right now, because frankly, the city ought to be pretty defenseless. It should be hers for the taking. And um, I doubt that she's going to be sitting on the Iron Throne at the end of the next episode. Uh, that would um, be very surprising. And speaking of the next episode, uh, I don't think HBO has actually released the title of it yet. So um, it's a bit of a mystery at the moment. Uh, what I do know, however, is that when I film that review, we will no longer be up here in the um, 
north-ish of Sweden, outside of Sundsvall. We are going to be back in our home outside of Gothenburg. Uh, and between there, we will have been at the Worldcon in Finland. So uh, if you're also going to the Worldcon, we might run into each other. Until then. <laughs>